morning, gang. Good morning. Ain't it a great way to start the new year with your brothers and sisters in Christ? Amen. Mm, I tell you, I am so thankful for each and every one of you. And uh, thankful for all the support you've given um, during a very difficult holiday season with mom and dad. Uh, dad's funeral went very well, I think. Um, mom still needs our prayers and support, so keep praying and encouraging her. I dedicate this message today to Dad because this was kind of where he believed. Um, this is what he believed in. Uh, he played a song at the funeral by Johnny Cash saying that his treasures are laid in heaven, or, or in heaven laid away. Um, and that's the truth. You know, that's the way we all should be. Our treasures in heaven are to be laid away for us. So today we're going to talk about why it's so important to believe that and how we come to know that. As we get ready to start a journey through the Sermon on the Mount. Now, a lot of people seem to think that these three chapters where the Sermon on the Mount is, is just filler. You know, that's a good teaches and it's good stuff, but we never really live it. And what I want to tell you is, for the next six months, we're going to dig into it deeper than we probably ever dug into anything before. And you all who've been in the Genesis class know how deep I like to dig. So you all know, I want to dig, and we're going to dig together. Uh, one of the things I encourage you to do, we've got sheets in the back. You can study throughout the week. There's a verse every day. All you got to do is just take that one verse and read it. If you want to review it through the week, you can do that. Just try to apply those scriptures and build yourself up in the scripture to be able to be able to defend what you're believing in. That's what the goal of this is, to teach you to connect scripture together and to be able to live what scripture says. And if somebody comes up and asks you, you don't just go and say, hey, my preacher says, okay? I don't want you to say my preacher. I want you to say Jesus' word says. I want you to be able to understand when we get into this, this is God's word speaking out. And we're going to dig right into it. I don't want to go in. It's, it's, got, it's basically this next six months, spiritual boot camp. And God is going to get us through it, man. He is going to work with us and encourage us through these three chapters in the book of Matthew, chapters 5, 6, and 7. And we're going to connect the scripture together and be able to build a closer, more tight-knit relationship with each other and with Christ Jesus. So we're going to dig in here. Starting this morning in uh, Matthew chapter 5, starting this morning in Matthew chapter 5, verses 1 through 3 is where we'll be at this morning. Don't seem like a lot, but guess what? There's a whole lot of meat to take in here. So we're going to dig right into it. You see, the Beatitudes describe the characteristics of people who belong to the kingdom of heaven. And this begins the most countercultural sermon one could possibly imagine. There is no greater sermon in Scripture, in my opinion. Now, a lot of people would like to say that we go by what Peter says on the day of Pentecost is probably the best and most definitive gospel sermon. Yes, in order to get to Jesus, he preached how to do it. But it is Jesus who is teaching here, and Jesus is teaching what it takes to be one of his disciples. And he gets into some pretty odd situations. Things that the people of this world would not view as successful, but that God deems as what builds us closer to Him. The characteristics that are described in the Sermon on the Mount are not characteristics anyone in the world would believe would make you successful, joyful, or blessed. But they do. Let's start... When we go and look at this first verse here, let's look at what this says. Seeing the crowds, he went up on the mountain. He sat down. His disciples came to him. And he opened his mouth and taught them, saying, verse 3, 
Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. That first verse there. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. We start our study with the result of being poor in spirit. The kingdom of heaven belongs to those who are poor in spirit. The kingdom of heaven is an expression that you only find in the book of Matthew, in Matthew's gospel. Why? Because Matthew is very Jewish. And he's trying to explain to Jewish people what's going on. The Jewish people knew that there would be a day coming, a day of the Messiah. They looked forward to it, a day when the king would come. The kingdom of heaven pulls together the entire hope of Israel's story for the kingdom of heaven, for the messianic age, a king, the land, the holy people, and redemptive power that will create holiness and peace. It is a phrase that represents the fullness of God's blessings. The kingdom looms large in Daniel's prophecy. When you go into the book of Daniel, and you go and you look throughout, and it's the only place where you'll find where the, or the kingdom of God and the Son of Man intersect. And that is the designation which Christ presents himself as most often, the Son of Man. The kingdom of heaven cannot be oversimplified to say that they are the, that they are the, the, these people are going to the kingdom of heaven. It can't just be saying, okay, well, everybody's going to heaven here that are poor in spirit. I want you to look at what this is saying. Okay? I want you to read this as it is written. Look at what the scripture says. The language of this sentence argues against that statement, saying that it is just people going to heaven. Look at what it says. Jesus didn't say theirs will be the kingdom of heaven. Rather, it says theirs is the kingdom of heaven. He says it in the present tense. Not the past tense, not the forward tense, not the future tense. He says, is now active, involved, engaged at this present moment. For theirs is the kingdom of God. The kingdom of heaven, okay? So the kingdom of heaven is a bigger picture here. The kingdom of heaven represents that there is a king. Who's the king of heaven? I know you all know the answer to that, don't you? Who's the king of heaven? God, right? And who is the son of God? And he's at the right hand of God, right? He's on the throne of heaven. So Jesus is the one who rules over heaven. God is the one who rules over heaven. His, their king has come. They, he is saying, the Messiah is here. He ain't saying, he ain't saying, you got this to look forward to. He's saying, no, no, no. It is now. Now is the time that the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Just as John had prophesied. Just as John the Baptist had prophesied many a time before in months and, in months and years past, he said that the one who would come, the Lamb who would come, the Messiah was coming, and he said his kingdom will be at hand. The kingdom of God is at hand. Is, not was, not could be, not maybe, not looking forward to some point in time when we're all going to heaven. No, he says now, now, here and now. And that's exactly what Jesus is saying. The kingdom is starting here. This is where the kingdom starts. The kingdom of heaven starts with Jesus Christ. Jesus, who rules over all nations and all peoples, destroying the enemies and judging the wicked. Those who are in his kingdom enjoy the benefits as citizens of the kingdom of heaven, receiving the designation as children of God in relationship with the Father because they have been redeemed. Make sense? Real simple. If you believe in Jesus Christ, if you obey the gospel, if you are... That if you seek Him and you obey Him and you look to Him as your Lord and Savior, guess what? You have been redeemed. But I think so many times the church takes that for granted. Why? 
Because look at what else that scripture says. It says, blessed are the poor in spirit. Now, I don't know about you all. When you all worshiping on a Sunday morning, do you all feel poor in spirit? You feel pretty good, don't you? You feel pretty good. You're blessed, man. You're excited. You get pumped up. You yeah. love Jesus. Love Jesus. Right? And you get excited and you praise God that much more and that much louder. If we are asked to describe the first characteristic of belonging in the kingdom of God, what characteristic do you think it'd be? I mean, think about that. Perhaps we would think of holiness or sinlessness. Perhaps we'd think of a need for perfect righteousness or obedience. But you know something? Just like we said at the very beginning of this message. Jesus' message here is countercultural. It's completely upside down. Like when Paul was going in and talking to people in Acts chapter 18, people were just crying out, He's turning the world upside down! That's what Jesus is doing. Jesus is turning the world upside down. Why? Because His teaching is so counterintuitive, countercultural. To this day, the teachers and religious leaders of Israel in Jesus' day, they were thinking and they were declaring that being wealthy, being perfect, being blessed, being rich, being all those things, all those great blessings and things, that was meaning you were following God. If you were poor, it means you were sinning. But do you know something? That ain't what Jesus is teaching here. Jesus says, blessed are the poor in spirit. Well, first thing, Jesus is not going based on what's in your pocket. Otherwise, he would have said, blessed are the poor in the wallet, or blessed are the poor in the bank, or blessed is the poor in destitute, whatever the case is. But he says, blessed are the poor in spirit. To be poor in spirit means what? What does that mean? Well, it means you recognize and understand our spiritual poverty. Before you became a Christian, did you have it all together? You probably thought you did. I know my dad did. He thought he had it all together when he was younger. He'll be the first one to tell you that. He was standing right here right now. He'd be the first one to tell you, man, I thought I had it all right when I was a kid. I enjoyed myself. I did things. I did things I'd later regret. Things that would hurt me. Then I gave them up and I gave them to God. And I overcame. Well, what does that mean? It means you have to understand and recognize that there are no resources that we can do in and amongst ourselves. There's nothing we can do, and therefore we have to look to God for help and depend on Him. To be poor in spirit is to stand without pretense before God. We're stripped of all our self-sufficiency, our self-security, our self-righteousness, anything that makes us self-made. You know what I mean? You ever, ever heard of a self-made man? You ever heard of somebody like that? There's no such thing. Or if they are made self-made, then they're not given the credit where credit is due. Because nobody is self-made. We're all God-made. But the problem is, what are we made in the image of? Are we made in the image of the world or the image of God? If we're made in the image of God, we're going to seek God. If we're made in the image of this world, we're going to keep seeking the world. And therein lies where we need sacrifice. If we are unwilling to give ourselves up to God, we're not going to get very far. I want to take a few moments to look at some examples that Jesus gave to show what being poor in spirit looks like. With these pictures, we'll have a better understanding of what this characteristic is. If you want to, you can go ahead and look in Luke chapter 15. You all have probably heard this sermon a few times in the past. I talked about this at my dad's funeral. And the reason I did was because Dad lived two different lives. Many of us that are Christians live two different lives. We were pre-pig pen and post-pig -po, uh, post pen. We were pre-pig pen and post-pig pen. What do I mean by that? 
Well, first off, you have to understand where you were beforehand, before the pig pen. You see, the prodigal son in chapter 15, verse 12 says, Father, give me the share of property that's coming to me. Did he deserve it? No. Did he earn it? No. Guess what? God gave it to him. God gives us all life. And we do with the life that God gives us and all the blessings and all the riches that come with this world that's in it. How we use our wealth and our riches and those things is up to us. Do we give it to God or do we give it to self? Well, the, this young prodigal son gave it to himself for a while until he hit the pig pen. We all know what happened after the pig pen. He came to understand, he came to his senses and returns to the Father. Listen to what he says here. He says, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Treat me as one of your hired servants. You catch that? You notice the difference there? The arrogance is gone. The you owe me is gone. I deserve is gone. What's re replaced by? I have sinned. I'm no longer worthy. Treat me as one of your hired servants. I am broke. Poor in spirit is the person who says, I've sinned against the Lord and I'm not worthy to be your son or belong to the kingdom. The opposite of being poor in spirit is to be a person who stands before God and tells God to give him what he deserves as if God owes something to us. Turn in Luke chapter 18 and we'll see another contrast that reveals what poverty looks like. In Luke chapter 18 verses 9 to 14, we're told of two different individuals in a parable of Jesus. Two very familiar individuals, a Pharisee and a tax collector. He also told a parable to some who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and treated others with contempt. Now catch what that scripture right there said that Luke described these people, that these people thought they had it all together. He goes and he says, Jesus says, two men went up into the temple to pray, one a Pharisee, the other a tax collector. The Pharisee, standing by himself, prayed thus, God, I thank you that I am not like other men, extortioners, unjust adulterers, and even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week. I give tithes to all that I get. But the tax collector, standing far off, would not even lift his eyes to heaven, but beat his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I tell you, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, but the one who humbles himself will be exalted. Why is the sinner justified? Was he justified because he'd done some kind of perfect righteous deeds? No. Was he justified because he was perfect? No. If you want to ask the average person in Israel during that time who was more justified, they would say the Pharisee. Why? Because the Pharisee was good, he was trustworthy, he was not doing bad things, and all kinds of righteous deeds like fasting twice a week and giving tithes and all he received. But Jesus said that the tax collector is the one who's justified. Why? Because he's justified because he's poor in spirit. He doesn't lift his eyes to heaven. He doesn't even acknowledge that anybody else is in the room. He doesn't acknowledge the presence of anyone. He is looking in himself. He is staring himself in his heart, and he is saying, I am a sinner. I'm a sinner. I'm not worthy of being in this house. I'm not worthy of being in your presence. I'm not worthy of being anywhere. Folks, I stand in this pulpit today. I'm not worthy to be in the pulpit. I'm not worthy to be in an assembly of like precious faith. I'm not. God put me here because He loves me. And I know that because I'm surrounded by people I love and care for in this room now. And those that are at home watching. 
that those people are going to hear the message that God has laid on my heart to go and press the issue. We need to be understanding where we are spiritually. I ain't no better than anybody else. I'm a sinner saved by grace. And that is where I stand today. I stand just like that tax collector, and you should too. We should be just like that tax collector, pounding our chest saying, we ain't worthy to be here. I ain't worth the blood that was spilt for me on Calvary's tree. God be merciful to me. This is the problem that was at the church of Laodicea. They were self-righteous, self-sufficient, and self-caring. They were secure in what they had. According to Revelation 3, 17, it says, You say, I'm rich, I have prospered, and I need nothing. Not realizing that you're wretched, pitiful, pitiful poor, blind, and naked. Why? They had everything. Man, look at America today. We are in a country that's in a recession. We're still rich. We've still got money. We still got to be able to take care of one another. We're able to take care of one another and encourage one another and strengthen one another and give one another presents at Christmas time around the tree and still have money to give the people who need it. There's a lot of countries not out there that can't do that. But we're blessed beyond measure. And the American church is looking more and more like Laodicea. Because the American church doesn't understand spiritually where they are. Just like the church at Laodicea, they don't recognize their spiritual poverty. They think, well, we've got money, we're good. No, don't matter how much money you have. What matters is how much spirit have you got in the game. How much of your life do you have in Christ? Want a good way to gauge how close you are to God? One of my friends said, look in your checkbook. What you give in your checkbook, not money-wise to go into God or to church, but what you spend on yourself, on your desires, on what you want, that will tell you how far you are with God. Now, I don't go and say you got to go and judge yourself based on what's in your pocketbook. What I go and I say you do is you go based on what's in your heart. How much time are you willing to give to Jesus? How much, how much of your energy are you willing to give to Jesus? You know, when you're spontaneous like we were during Halloween and different times like that, you can outreach to so many different people. You know why? Because you're trusting in God. You're not trusting in, in me or any other person. You're going and you're giving it to God and saying, God, you bless this. You take care of this. That's the very first principle of the kingdom of heaven. We are beggars before God. Every one of us. The kingdom citizens beg. They don't brag. Jesus said it best in John chapter 15, verse 5, when he said, I am the vine, you are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. We can't do nothing without Jesus. In John chapter 9, verses 39 to 41, Jesus said, The judgment I came into this world that those who do not see may see, that those who see may become blind. Some of the Pharisees near him heard these things and said to him, Are we also blind? Jesus said to them, If you were blind, you would have no guilt. But now that you say, We see, your guilt remains. All of these pictures show us what it means to be poor in spirit and the opposite what it means to be loathing in spirit and being, who, being selfish in spirit. This is the attitude that is required, though, to be in the kingdom of heaven is that we depend on God. Depending on ourselves is at odds with the kingdom. God wants people who know they are spiritually needy. God wants people to see that their personal goodness just isn't good enough for His standards. 
There's going to be people that hate me when I say this. There are going to be nice people going to hell. Nice people going to hell, yeah. People who give. People who give to charities. People who go and commit time and energy and strength to all the causes of this world that don't do anything to harm another person. Go about their daily lives. are going to hell. Why? It's because God wants to send them there? No. It's because they're missing one important point. The very first step in being a part of the kingdom of heaven is to understand we're spiritually bankrupt and we need God. That's not saying too much. That's saying the truth. We need God. There is only one thing that's going to stop you from serving God. You. That's it. No one else is going to stop you from serving God. You. You stop you from serving God. The very same people that go and say, I can worship God in the woods and the wilderness are the very ones that are going to be responsible for failing God because they are willing to go and get God on their terms, not His. I want you to listen to what Jesus is saying here. Quit clinging to your ways and start clinging to God. Quit clinging to the ideas that you think are right. And start clinging to Jesus. Being poor in spirit is the only way we will allow Jesus to rule over our lives. This is why Isaiah prophesied about the coming of the righteous king and, he, and who he was going to deliver. He says in Isaiah 61, 1, The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted to proclaim liberty to the captives and the opening of the prison to those who are bound. Who? The poor. You have to know who you are so that you can be set free by Jesus. You have to know. So why does modern Christianity reject self-empty? Why do they roll in the mire of selfishness and pleasing themselves? Well, I can't tell you why. The only thing I can guess is because they don't want to be biblical. They would much rather be comfortable. I don't want to be comfortable. I want to be righteous. I want to be serving God. And self-righteousness is not the answer. Jesus is the answer, the only answer. Jesus emptied himself according to Philippians chapter 2, and we are to have that same mindset that is in Christ Jesus. Can you imagine a best-selling, a best-selling Christian book being called How to Be Nothing? Or how about The Blessing of Being a Nobody? You don't see that out on the bookshelves, do you? Always be the best, always be the top, always be the cream of the crop. Sometimes being the best means being the meekest. Sometimes being the best means being the least. When it comes to Jesus, that's the first point in the kingdom. We are to be poor. We are to come to him as we are, just as I am. Remember that song? Just as I am, without one plea? Yeah. But that, thy blood was shed for me. I can only be clothed in the garments of Christ. I have to come to Him naked. That means exposed for who I am, a sinner. You do too. It means you come to Him based on who you are. Being poor in spirit is recognizing that we have nothing to give God. You know... In the songbooks, we have a song called Rock of Ages. I think it's one in a hundred and five. Maybe wrong. Let me get that looked up here. I think it's 105. I may be wrong. Yeah, 
Yep, it ain't 105. It's one of these up in here. Here it is, 103. I'm sorry, I was too off. The second verse in that reads, Not the labor of my hands can fulfill the law's demands. Could my zeal no respite know? Could my tears forever flow? All for sin I could not atone. Thou must save, thou alone. Now, there is another verse that isn't in this version, which I like just as much. Nothing in my hand I bring, simply to thy cross I cling. Naked come to thee for dress, helpless look to thee for grace. Vile I to the fountain fly, wash me, Savior, or I die. This is what the rock of ages holds for us. Only the grace of gospel and the comprehension of our great sin and lack righteousness, our lack of righteousness, can bring us to poverty of spirit. We must hear the words of the scripture that only God is good. Jesus says those words in Luke chapter 18, verse 19. No one is righteous, just as Romans 3, 10 to 12 says. And just as Jeremiah 10, 23 says, to understand that it is not in us to direct our steps. We can't do it, but God can. There's no grace for us until we are poor in spirit and acknowledge that. It is not until we are poor in spirit that we can see how glorious Christ is and understand His riches toward us. Just as Johnny Cash sung, our riches are in heaven laid away. Will you accept that as the truth? Will you accept that we need Jesus Christ today? It is not until we acknowledge that how glorious Christ is and how wonderful Christ is by admitting that we don't have it. We don't have it all. That we're poor. We're broke. We have to grasp our deadness and blindness due to sin to see the life that is available in Christ. You want to really get fired up for Jesus? Let me tell you, the new year is amazing, guys. 2023 can start something amazing for you. And the first place you have to admit and start at is saying, I need Jesus to pay my debt. I need him every day to pay my debt. I ain't worthy of being here, guys. None of us are. The last shall be first, according to Matthew 19.30. We must stand without pretense before God, stripped of all self-sufficiency, self-security, and self-righteousness. We need to be begging for mercy. The mark of Christianity is not sinlessness. For the Apostle John said that much in 1 John when he said that anyone that thinks that way are only deceiving themselves. Mark of Christianity is a growing awareness of our sinfulness. God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I pray that you will look in your heart today and look to see where Jesus wants you. That in His light, in His glory, in His grace, He shows you that we're spiritually bankrupt and we need Him. You're not going to get salvation from me. You're not going to get salvation from any building. You're going to get salvation from Christ. And that's who we come to. This morning, if you've got a decision to follow Jesus Christ for the first time, believe in Jesus Christ. Repent of your sin. Confess Jesus Christ is the Son of the living God and be baptized in His name for the forgiveness of sin. Not because I said so, not because the building that you're in here right now says so, because God's Word said so.
The Scripture doesn't lie to us. We need Jesus. And we come to Him on His terms.